text this morning is Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 27. So if you'll stand now with me for the reading of the word of God. Romans chapter 8, working our way through, we're at verse 18, going through verse 27. These are the words of God. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope, for what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then we do with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what to pray for, as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And this is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. And let's pray. Father in heaven, we come to you this morning in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we ask that by your Spirit, you would work in the hearts present here today each and every one of us, through the preaching of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There is glory on the horizon. There's glory on the horizon. And it is a glory of immeasurable weight. And one which is longed for by all of creation. This glory outshines all other supposed glories. And it overshadows all trials, suffering, and pain. This glory is our redemption. The glory being anticipated by all the earth is our liberty and resurrection. This glory is, as we read, the revealing of the sons of God. A day is coming in which complete freedom will be seen and known by the children of God as well as all creation. This glory, Paul tells us, is the perfection of the bride of Christ. This is what all things are working towards and what we long for to the praise of God's glorious grace. And we do not do this thing on our own. It's not as if God gives us a vision for what's to come and then expects us to carry it out on our own. He's given us his spirit. And he will see to it that Christ's name is glorified and magnified in all the earth. It's not as common for us to hear creation characterized as it is in our text this morning by the Apostle Paul. We have creation looking on, creation groaning, creation anticipating. But God has made all things He's made all things and he commands all creation to worship him and so they do. Creation declares the glory of God and all of creation worships God and as worshipers of God, they delight to see God glorified. And so all of creation looks forward to this glory to be revealed in us. And this helps us to see how big this whole plan is, how monumental and significant. We are part of something that all of creation longs to see and this should shape our perspective in the present. So let's look at verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Remembering back uh, last week in verse 17, Paul says that we are heirs with Christ, right? The children of God, if so be that we suffer with him. That's the qualification. That we may may be also glorified with him. If we suffer with him, then we'll be glorified with him. And Christians are called to suffer For the name of Jesus Christ, to be hated and despised by a world that hates our God as we proclaim his just judgments and the free and full forgiveness found in Jesus Christ alone. And this is our lot. To suffer for Christ is the lot of every Christian. And so we're to take it up with gratitude. If you are a Christian, then Jesus has bled and died for your sins. He's bled and died for your sins. So the question is, do you meditate on that truth? Does that have weight in your heart? You are commanded to suffer reproach, but you're commanded to do so in the name of your Savior. 
you who are in Christ are not going to hell. And that's because Jesus was accursed. Jesus bled and died for your sins. So if obedience to Jesus to the point of suffering, if being hated by the cool kids, scoffed at by the worldly wise, discourages you or sounds too radical to you, then repent. You're not that cool. Right? Repent of your cool kid syndrome. Repent of your entitlement to heaven. Repent of thinking you're owed a comfortable life and from seeking to be the kind of Christian who enters heaven without calluses on your hands, without wounds from the battle. For we are in a war. Right? We're in a war against principalities and powers, as Paul says elsewhere. We're in a war against all the enemies of Christ. But God in his infinite wisdom is bringing the assault on the offensive against the gates of hell, and he's doing so by means of his church. And this means we, the church, must be willing to suffer. We need to be in the fight, and service in this fight will yield much fruit for each of us. Suffering can feel, on the face of it, to be a very discouraging experience, believe it or not. Right? As Zach mentioned last week, in the previous section of Romans 8, we are in this passage primarily talking about suffering Christian persecution. So this isn't, you know, you get a flat tire on your way home on the highway, not that kind of suffering. Christian persecution, suffering for the name of Christ. Suffering can feel discouraging, it can make you want to quit. When you reap negative earthly consequences for obedience to Christ, or even when you're just threatened with those consequences, here's what's going to come about if you do this thing, you may want to give up. Right? When family members ask you to dial it back, many of us have had those experiences, or your work is requiring something immoral of you, you begin to lose friendships due to your obedience to Christ. The temptation, especially if we're looking primarily to our circumstances, if we're driven by our circumstances, will be to turn from Christ and to serve another master. And Paul gives us a solution here, and that's to direct our eyes heavenward. Paul directs our eyes heavenward. The key to understanding our present suffering and continuing faithfully through that suffering is to understand what is on each side of the scale. Right? Picture a scale, two sides, and to fix our hope on what's, what the reality is on that scale. The scale has our present sufferings on one side and future glory on the other. Present sufferings on one side, future glory on the other. And the scale's not wavering in the balance. You don't need to get down to eye level to see which one's more weighty. And the scale's pinned down. The scale is pinned down. The future glory far outweighs the most intense and extreme suffering that we could, that we could imagine or that could come to us in this life. Right? Remember who's writing this. It's the Apostle Paul. He knew suffering better than each of us. This was a man who had received lashings for the name of Jesus. Paul was a man stoned, a man shipwrecked a man beaten and imprisoned. And yet he declares that none of that suffering holds a candle to the weight of eternal glory. Paul has mourned, think back to Romans 7, he's mourned over the presence of indwelling sin, even as a Christian. But in glory, it'll be gone. Right? That mourning will be gone because sin will be dealt with. Paul has suffered physical harm and decay, but in glory, that will be gone. Paul has been wrought with anxiety over the churches, but in glory, gone. The church perfected, the church secure. Paul, in our text, later on will mention his inability to pray as he ought to. But in glory, we will worship our Lord perfectly. When Jesus ushers in the consummate new heavens and new earth, it's all over. Suffering cannot outlast your life. All right? Think about that. Suffering cannot outlast your life. However long your life is, if you're in Christ, the day you die is the day suffering is over forever. That's it. The glory of the new heavens and the new earth, on the other hand, will never fade away. It will never fade away. It will be the permanent state forevermore. Tears will be wiped away. Sin permanently removed from our hearts and minds and even from the ground we walk on. So is nurturing your children in the fear and admonition of the Lord difficult? Have you met with trials in your evangelism efforts? Are you struggling as you seek to do all that you do in your work unto Christ? Well, ask God for strength and press on. Simple as that. Ask God for strength and press on. Suffer faithfully for Christ and suffer with joy. Why? Because glory awaits us. Glory awaits us. A glory, Paul says, will be revealed in us. And so may we usher in the day 
As we've mentioned previously, working through Romans 8, this is known as a very comforting section of Scripture, and it it is. Uh, But Paul's words come as a comfort only to those who are walking the road of suffering after Christ. That's who these words are comforting to. What comfort do you expect from God's word if you will not walk after Christ? There's no place in all the scriptures you can go to to find comfort from God if you refuse to worship his son. That category doesn't exist. So if you won't suffer for Christ now, don't expect comfort from his word. It will not be found. Seek to walk after Christ, and we know already from Romans 7 we're not going to do that perfectly. We're going to have indwelling sin, but seek to walk after Christ. Great comfort. Great comfort in these words. Verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Creature is a reference to all of creation. Right? All that has been made by the creator of all things. God has made all things and in God all things hold together. Paul refers to this creation here as a singular creature. But we are talking about the longing of beasts, large and small. The longing of the ground and the sea, plants and trees, stars and moon. All the creatures and all of creation have a sincere expectation for things to be better than they currently are. And all of creation is here seen anticipating, right, looking forward. The creation wants to see something come about, and that is partly because this thing coming about has implications for the creation itself. Right? They will be affected by this thing coming about. All of creation is waiting, we read, for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now we are the sons of God. But there are many more. God has always had a people set apart to himself. And he's continuing to save sinners. And may he do so today in the preaching of his word. He's continuing to save sinners on this earth through the preaching of his gospel. And when will these sons be truly manifest? When will we know truly who the sons of God are? And who belongs to Christ? Well, it will be on that day that we long for, the day of resurrection. It'll be on the day of resurrection. All those who belong to Christ will be given resurrected bodies on that great day, and the sons of God will be made manifest. It will be a public declaration on that day, and all of creation will rejoice. Creation wants the glory that will be revealed in us to come to fruition, to see God gather up all of his children, because this will mark their redemption as well. We've gone to verse 20. For the creature was made subject to vanity, Not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. And nothing on this earth is on the same level as man. Men and women are made in the image of God, and nothing else on this earth can say the same. Nothing on this earth can say the same. And so the animals are not awaiting the day when PETA arises to power And animals reign on the earth. No more speciesism. They're awaiting the revealing of the sons of God. That's what they're waiting for. We see the reality of this truth play out here when Paul tells us that the whole creation, all of creation, was plunged under the curse of sin because of the sin of man. Adam sinned, and so the world was cursed. Adam's sin had consequences for all the creatures below him all the creatures under his care, and even for his own seed. And we know it to be so, right? We know this to be so. The world is full of death and decay. Animals are pitted against one another, which is exactly the opposite of what we know the new heavens and the new earth will look like. Some animals go extinct. Others live their days in fear. Animals suffer under cruel masters. And creation is far from undisturbed. We have hurricanes and earthquakes, tornadoes. It's not good to have an earth that sometimes swallows up the men dwelling on it who are meant to subdue it. It's a sign that things are a little bit off. Right? And this is the fruit of the curse of sin. The world is judged for the sins of men. Think back to the flood of Noah's day and think about the fossil record. Right? If you were not on the ark, if you were an animal in that day and you're not on the ark, then you were buried under the great waves of the flood. Many animals suffered alongside men in that flood, and surely many species of trees and plants were killed as well. Right? The world is not what it ought to be. We still behold glorious things, but even those are bleak compared to what they would be apart from the stain of sin. We can't even imagine that. Everything has been tarnished. Sin has marred the whole creation. 
On one level, thinking back to our, those two verses, 20 and 21, it makes sense to say that Adam is the one who brought about this subjection to vanity, right? They were subjected to vanity, and who brought about this subjection? On one level, it makes sense to say that it was Adam, right? Adam's the one who sinned in the Garden of Eden, and now the world is under a curse, right? Apart from Adam's sin, the world would continue to be declared good by God and operate under his blessing. But Paul says that the one who subjected the creation to vanity did so in hope, right? In hope of deliverance. And this is not Adam. It's firstly God who brought about this subjection to vanity for all of creation. God brought it about though it was accomplished through the willful sin of Adam. So God with perfect justice subjected the whole world to the futility of sin in light of the sin of Adam. The animals in all creation are man's responsibility for better or worse. Adam was to be a conqueror and a subduer of all creation. He was to work the ground. He was to be fruitful with Eve. And he was to have dominion over the rest of creation. Adam failed as a steward over this creation. And instead of... to leave creation in a state of being cursed. Goal, but rather the setup. I'm fine without it if it's an issue. No worries. The, creation, the curse of creation set the stage. Right? The curse on creation set the stage so that there would be a longing, a hope for deliverance. Specifically, God desired that all of creation would long to be delivered into the one and only glorious liberty that was coming, and that is our deliverance. That's our deliverance. Creation does not long for some separate deliverance, but for the liberty of the children of God, right? the manifestation of the sons of God. Creation has been given the privilege of looking on to see God work redemption for his chosen people and to be a part of that glorious deliverance when sin is finally removed from all the redeemed and the earth is renewed along with them. At the focal point of all of history is Jesus Christ on the cross. And God has subjected the whole world to vanity so that there would be one collective longing by all of the lower creatures, and all the inanimate creation, to have freedom from corruption, to see a perfected bride adorned for her husband. God ordained before creation that he would be glorified in the redeeming of a people for himself. And so it makes sense that this reality, that as this reality comes to fruition in the building up of the church, there'd be an anticipation by all that God has made. All of creation longs to see what is coming and to partake in the overflow of the glory that will be revealed. We have a picture in scripture of what this creation will be like in light of this liberty for the creation. All right, wolves will dwell with lambs, calves with lions, all led by little children. Babies will play next to the hole of an asp, and no one will be concerned. Bears will feed next to cows, and the cow won't be constantly looking over his shoulder. None shall hurt or destroy in all of God's creation. For the knowledge of God will no longer be sparse in the land, but it will be everywhere. Verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Now, this is the language of childbirth. And the first of three groanings that we see in our passage. Right? The second being, so we here we have creation groaning. The second being our groaning, those who have the first fruits of the Spirit. And the third being the Spirit himself groaning. Paul is saying that creation, all of it, is working as a laboring mother bringing forth a child. Right? And the pain of this childbirth will bring forth the fruit of a child. The pain of this travailing experience by all of creation is the revealing of the sons of God. The pain is experienced until the church is brought into the fullness of its glory, sanctified, washed, and cleansed for her perfect bridegroom, the Lord Jesus Christ. And since the coming of Christ, and really always, but certainly since the coming of Christ, Satan has sought to snuff out the church. And God has used the imagery of pregnancy to describe this dynamic. In the book of Revelation, chapter 12, a woman, representative of faithful Israel, gives birth to a child. And the child is representative of Jesus Christ. Satan is in the story as a great red dragon seeking to kill the man-child. Satan fails, and after failing to kill 
the man-child, turns and tries to wipe out the woman and her other offspring, which is the rest of the church. Satan tries in the early days of the church to bring his wrath against them, but God uses Satan's tactics then to destroy the enemies of God instead. And even now, even now, and all the way to the day of consummation, Satan would love nothing more than to see a stillbirth for the bride of Christ. Satan wants to abort this child. He wants the pain and groaning of all creation to end in in an abortion and not with a glorified bride. He wants all of it to be in vain. Think about it. A holy and spotless bride both glorifies Jesus and marks the definitive end of Satan. It marks his definitive end. And so Satan hates it all the way through. Childbearing is highly praised in the Bible. God uses this figurative language to describe some of the most glorious realities we are called to behold. It ought to be the prayer of every family in this church. Prayer of every family in this church that God would bless your families with fruitful wombs and they would not live for yourselves but be fruitful and multiply. You ought to long to fill your home with image bearers of God that you were able to discipline, disciple, and nurture and by the mercy of God, see grow into maturity in Christ. Abortion and marital sterilization for your own convenience is of the devil. Satan delights to see families that bear the name of Christ being intentionally barren. He loves our American culture of abortion and birth control spurred on by our lavish lifestyles that have no room for the sacrifice of having children. Satan loves how long we put off having children and how much the church resembles the culture in our pursuit of childbearing. Satan loves our praising of sodomy and sodomite marriage as a culture only furthering our barrenness. Barrenness is suffering. That's how the Bible talks about barrenness. It's a suffering. Intentional barrenness is a slap in the face to God and to those who labor daily in prayer for the blessing of a child. God does not love such folly and evil. God loves fruitfulness. He delights in praises from the mouths of babes. His word has promises for our children. And so we're to take hold of those by faith. We are in a war and we ought to seek to see the army of God built up. We do this first by making disciples in our own home and then in our community. Satan has a goal in this war. He wants to snuff out the church. He wants the labor to be in vain. He wants barrenness in every family, barrenness in our witness for Christ, and ultimately barrenness for all of creation as it awaits the glorification of the church of Jesus Christ. But Satan and his demons take up arms against the king of heaven and his host, and Jesus will most assuredly win the battle. He will see to it that his church bears much fruit. Verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. So creation is groaning and travailing for the revealing of the sons of God and to partake in that liberty. Paul says that these early Christians are also groaning. We have seen already in Romans 8 that Christians are marked by the fact that they are in the Spirit of God, and that they follow after the Spirit of God as they put to death the deeds of the flesh. There is no such thing as a Christian who's not filled with the Spirit of God. No such thing. The Spirit is the one who gives new birth and who indwells every believer. Christians are groaning for the same thing as all creation, described here in slightly different terms by Paul. We groan within ourselves for our adoption to be made manifest, which is again sealed as we receive resurrected bodies. And think about the grace of God to us in the present. We're not left to ourselves in this process. It's not as if we groan with no hope. Paul elsewhere tells us that the Holy Spirit was given to us as a seal. He tells us to the church in Ephesus. In earnest of our inheritance, which is rightly ours through our union with Jesus. If we have union with Jesus, then we have the seal of his Holy Spirit. The Spirit seals us into the day of redemption. when We will see our adoption consummated. Our bodies will be redeemed. Already God has delivered us from the bondage of sin and Satan through the work of Jesus Christ. We've seen that already in Romans. And yet we await a consummation. 
And at the consummation, sin will be done away with. Our mortal bodies will put on immortality and we will live forever as sons of God. We will praise our Savior and live in his perfect kingdom. No end of days or songs, no end of feasts or stories or joy. And though we have the first fruits of the Spirit, which is more than the groaning creation can say, we long for more. We long for resurrected bodies that are freed from the curse of sin within us and to be in a creation no longer marred by the curse of sin. We await a day when we are completely freed from our bodies of death to live forevermore with our Lord. That is what we groan for. It's what we ought to groan for. And although those of you in Christ have your adoption sealed already, if you're in Christ, you have your adoption sealed already, there's a day coming in which God will publicly declare your sonship. It will be plain to all. It will be plain to all, just as it was when Jesus rose from the dead. Adoption is at the heart of the gospel message. Adoption is at the heart of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. God the Father chose to adopt sinners in love. He did this by sending his son, Jesus Christ, truly God and truly man, to live and to die in our place, in the place of sinners. And after dying on a cross, Jesus rose from his tomb and declared his victory over sin and death. God adopts us as his children by giving us union with his son in his death and resurrection, by accrediting Jesus' work to us. And so we are his children purely by his grace. This is the reality for all who turn from their sins and trust in Jesus for eternal life. So that is your call today if you are not a follower of Jesus. It's to turn from your sin, which will damn you if you do not turn from it, and to trust in Jesus for eternal life. Again, Jesus rose from the dead, and it is declared to be the seal of our justification. So we know that we are made right with God through the work of Jesus because he rose from the dead. The fact that he rose from the dead gives us confidence. We know with surety that he paid for sin, that it's done, and that we have salvation in him. Jesus overcame sin and death. Likewise, our own resurrection will make a declaration. It will declare definitively our union with Jesus, our sonship, our adoption as children and heirs of God. Only pure grace and unparalleled mercy could make sinners like us heirs with Christ. Pure grace, unparalleled mercy. This is so far from what we ought to be able to say. How are we able to talk about this this morning? Pure grace, unparalleled mercy, so far from what we deserve. And so glory to God. And just as Satan hates fruitfulness, Satan hates adoption. Satan hates adoption. He hates when Christ's people care for orphans. Satan delights to see orphans abandoned. And so those of you who are able should seek to adopt children. Verses 24 and 25. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then we do with patience wait for it. And we're talking this morning about future glory. We're talking about future rewards, future blessings, a future life in which sin is done away with, and when we dwell in perfection. But we don't get to hold any of these things in our hands now. We can't touch them, we can't see them. Instead, we're told in word. We're just told in word, in the word of God. And so we must trust. Christians are called again and again to trust God, to take him at his word. We are to have faith in the promises of God, which are ours only in Christ. But in Christ, we have all of them. And it is faith in the promises of God that gives us hope. It's faith in the promises of God that gives us hope. Our hope is our expectation of what will come about in light of the promises of God. So faith drives us to hope. Faith drives us to hope. And our hope is steadfast when it is rooted on the promises of God found in his word. Right? There's sundry false hopes in the world. People place stock in all kinds of false ideologies and look forward to false realities. Right? That's everywhere around us. People hope in a God who will not judge them for their sins. Others in a God who will reward them positively in light of their own works on this earth. People hope in the praises of men and the fleeting satisfactions of sin. People hope in financial security 
and love from their families. But there is one hope. There is but one hope. Jesus is the only hope of the world. He's the only Savior of men. He's the only sufficient sacrifice for sins. There's only one mediator between God and man, and it's the man Christ Jesus. And God in his wisdom has called us to be a people who live by faith and not by sight, which means we must hope for something which we also cannot see. We do not behold Jesus in an image. In fact, we are told rather clearly and expressly not to do so. We know Jesus truly with eyes of faith. We know Jesus truly with eyes of faith and not by sight. We know a day is coming and we will behold Jesus by sight and will be made like him. We will have glorified eyes when we see him face to face. Our eyes of faith are shaped by the Spirit of God as he illuminates the Word of God to us. We go to the Word of God to know who Jesus truly is. That's where we go. Only to the Word of God to know who Jesus truly is. And so our eyes of faith are shaped by the Spirit of God as he illuminates the Word of God to us. We must recognize how quick each of us is to form God after our own image. And we must be diligent to conform our minds and our understanding to the scriptures every time. Certainly you should read lots of good books, see to it that your family is doing the same, but we must live in the Bible. We must live in the Bible. God has put us in a position in which which we must wait. We're in a, a waiting pattern, a holding pattern. And so we must have hope. We can't see it, and so we must trust in him to be true to his promises. If we could see it, as Paul says, there wouldn't be much to hope for. Rather, it would already be our reality. God wants this season to be a season of life in which we are suffering and trusting. Suffering and trusting. One of going through trials and longing for future glory. Our lives now are a time in which God desires that we would cultivate patience as we live lives of faith, trusting in his promises and living accordingly. Suffering will feel long and difficult. Christ will not delay. Christ will not delay. His timing is perfect and our hope is fixed in heaven with him. And so we're to live in such a way that we'd be most to be pitied if Christ had not raised from the dead. We know he has and so we have great hope. Verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. God has sent his Son to accomplish our redemption. And the Father and Son have sent the Spirit to apply this work of redemption to the heart of every believer. The Spirit is described by Jesus as our helper. He was given to grant new hearts, to reveal truth, to strengthen us unto good works, and to seal us unto the day of redemption. That's why the Spirit was given to us. And we are radically weak. Each of us is radically weak. We need immense help from God if we're to do anything worthwhile for his kingdom. And even then, it's only received if it's offered up in Christ. Prayer is not an exception to our need for help, but a chief example. If we're honest with ourselves, prayer is not in a separate category, but probably one of the chief examples of our weakness, our inability. Our prayers shed light on our desires. uh, We're often deeply concerned with our circumstances. Deeply concerned. Really grieves us. And care very little for the glory of God. We come into prayer with a list of requests for our lives and do not spend any time in confession of sins, in thanksgiving to God, or in adoration for who God is. And this is with an operating assumption that you're praying at all. And even our requests are directed at earthly circumstances. Rather than God's name being hallowed, his kingdom being established on the earth. We are often not good judges of what we need when we come to God in prayer. We insist that we need certain things when God knows it would be horrible for us. Not only so, but we often enter prayer with apathetic hearts, wandering minds. There's little preparation of our hearts, little reverence. Little focus. Even when we're convinced of the necessity for prayer, we don't enter into it with the zeal we know we ought to. We tend to measure our success in prayers by the rhetoric we use, the loftiness of our speech, internal feelings we have deep down and within a chill down your spine during your prayer time. What God calls us to and what the Spirit teaches us, what God calls us to and what the Spirit teaches us is to pray with faith and to do so consistently. 
Pray with faith and do so consistently. Pray with faith, meaning trust the promises of God and do so consistently. Feelings will waver and fancy words can be just as shallow as any others. Pray with faith and do so every day. And as an aside, the Lord's Prayer should be a place we continually turn to for guidance in our prayers. If you feel like you're kind of hitting a roadblock in your prayer life, not praying as you ought to pray, Jesus literally taught us how to pray. When you pray, pray this way. It forces us, the Lord's Prayer, if you work through it, work through it this week in your family worship, it forces us to begin with a concern for God's glory. Father in heaven, and his name being hallowed, his kingdom coming. It forces us to confess our sins. We're reminded of our need to forgive one another as well. To thank God for his provisions and to entreat him for our daily needs. And so turn to that. Turn to it often. Paul lumps himself in with all Christians here in our verse. Right? The apostle knew not what to pray for as he ought. This is a common struggle for all Christians, a sign of how great our infirmity is and how desperately we need help as we seek to follow Christ. The Holy Spirit gives us that help. He teaches us to pray. He moves us to pray and even offers up prayers for us. The Spirit groans as well. And remember that the Holy Spirit has already been described to us in Romans 8 as the spirit of adoption. Right? We're longing for our adoption and he is the spirit of adoption groaning along with us. The Spirit is groaning toward the same as us, which is the sealing of our adoption. He has been given to us for this express purpose, that he would hold us until the end. And so his groanings align with our groaning. The Holy Spirit carries us all the way through, as Paul says elsewhere, to the praise of his glory. The Spirit's groaning is an intercessory groaning. Right? He's doing it on our behalf. And so we should understand it as an efficacious groaning. We should understand it as affecting that which he's seeking out to do. God doesn't fail in accomplishing, accomplishing that which he sets out to do. If God sets out to accomplish something, he will surely bring it to pass. And so if the Spirit is here interceding, then we know he's doing so with perfect efficacy, perfect success. Where we are unable to express ourselves and fall short of the sorts of prayers that we ought to be offering to God, the Spirit groans. We know that Christ intercedes for us at the right hand of God, and that should be a great comfort to you. That after rising from the dead, Jesus ascended to the right hand of the Father where he now intercedes for every one of his children, or every one of his brothers and sisters, I should say. We are told here that the Spirit also intercedes. The Spirit also intercedes. And though the groanings cannot be understood by us, there is one who understands. Verse 27, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And God is the searcher of hearts. God's the searcher of hearts. He knows the thoughts of every man's heart. Every intention of man is plain to God. And so this truth should strike terror in you if you do not belong to Jesus. Right? Every wicked thought, very plain to God. He's a God of justice. But for the Christian, there's nothing but a great encouragement here. Nothing but a great encouragement. God is able to see those things which we have trouble finding words to express. He also sees his own spirit in us. And that spirit intercedes for us, we read, according to the will of God. The spirit intercedes for us according to the will of God. And so we are continually having our wills conform to the will of God the more the spirit intercedes and teaches us. And Jesus said we'd have all we ask for if we ask in accordance with the will of God. And the spirit is doing just this on our behalf and teaching us to do the same. So Jesus intercedes for us in heaven in the spirit in our hearts. God has surrounded our prayers with his own prayers for us by his son and his spirit. This is a great mercy and ought to be a great encouragement to us and should we, we should pray all the more. And the more we see Paul lay out the nature of our salvation as we work through Romans, the more we see that our salvation is resting on a foundation completely outside of ourselves. The triune God is working in glorious ways. And it is he who is not just planning, but accomplishing, and we see here, securing our victory. There's nothing more glorious in all the world. Think about the picture. Right? Think about the picture that Paul's painting. All of creation looks on with groaning. Creation is trying to peek over the horizon. And what they want to see is us glorified. 
They want to see the church in its maturity, ready to feast at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Creation wants to see sin removed from the people of God so that they can enjoy the liberty and joy that will come to all of creation on that day. We are awaiting the same thing. And when we remember this hope, when we have our eyes fixed on this hope, our present sufferings become altogether light. If we're seeing this rightly, with eyes of faith, then it will make our present sufferings begin to seem altogether light. And how will this glory come about? Well, the very Spirit of God is at work. He will wash us. He will purify us. He will intercede for us. The Spirit will see to it that we obtain our inheritance as he seals us unto the end. And you think about the world right now and things don't look great. It doesn't look like we're trending in that direction. Things look pretty bad. We're seeing again and again that there's no hope in ourselves, no hope in humanity. And so we're instead set up. We're set up for the only hope. And that is the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. The world needs resurrection life and nothing less will suffice. And so as the spirit works in and through us, may we long for that day of future glory. May we keep our eyes fixed on the glorious reality to come. And may we now, in the meantime, proclaim Christ. And amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven. Give us eyes of faith to see the future glory that is ours in Christ. We thank you for your spirit who teaches us, guides us, intercedes for us. Pray that you continue to align our wills with your will. We may glorify you in our lives, considering suffering now a joy as we look to our crucified and risen Savior who died in our place and rose in our place so that we may have life with you forever. We love you, we pray in Jesus' name, and amen.